Right, here we go. We're looking at Matthew 26, and we're going to be looking from verse 57 to the end of the chapter. I should introduce, as you're opening in your Bibles and becoming ready to, uh, to study with me, um, I should let you know that originally I actually took two weeks to do the two studies that we're doing here. And in, in some ways, these studies are, are very different, very different studies. I am really inclined just from a very, uh, just because the passage connects with me, I'm very inclined towards the second portion of our study, which will begin in verse 69. The first portion of the studies begins in verse 57, and we're going to be looking at uh, Jesus before Caiaphas. But then we're going to move into, I think, a very practical aspect of the, the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to be looking at, at steps to denial. We're going to be looking at how Peter ended up denying the Lord. And I want to share, and I'm going to be sharing details with both, in both of those studies. You can get ready if you take notes, take some notes and all. But my heart is really, really inclined towards the, the exhortation that we find in this scripture, a warning to us, an encouragement to us to be aware of the fact that denial is only a step away. And I, I'm not teaching you this passage to teach you how to deny Jesus. I think by nature we already know how. What I want to do is share about how easy it is to move into that direction, especially in the era that we live in today, which it seems to be an atmosphere of rejection of Christ in an unprecedented way in my lifetime. So I'll be sharing with you verses 57 to verse 68. Then it's like a second study from verse 69 to the conclusion of the chapter. So let's begin reading together here in verse 57. I'll read to verse 68. I'll give you that study, then we'll move into the second one. So Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He's deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. Others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? And so what we have here is we have Jesus Christ who is being led away to Caiaphas. We need to remember that he had been taken into custody by the soldiers and officers that had been sent to arrest him. Jesus had been in what was called the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, Judas uh, had set him up to be arrested. Now, I wanted to make a point that I didn't make to you when we went through that in the first, uh, first studies concerning Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I wanted to point something out to you. Um, when you're in Israel, and say you're um, on, if you've been to Jerusalem, if you're in the city of Jerusalem and you're in an area called the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount is where they have the Dome of the Rock now. It's where the, the temple at one time had been. If you were standing on the Temple Mount, where the Western Wall is, and if you're on inside there, 
and you, you walk to the north, you're going to go to an area there past the Dome of the Rock that is called the Dome of the Spirit or the Dome of the Tablets. We, we do Bible studies there. When you stand there at the Dome of the Spirits, when you stand there and you look to the east, when you look to the east, you see the Mount of Olives. And so as you're there looking across to the Mount of Olives, there is a, a, an area there called the uh, uh, Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley runs from that area all the way southeast and empties into the Dead Sea. And I'm giving you the geography so that you'll know something about it, because during the time of Christ, there were lambs that were slaughtered for Passover. And when the people would slaughter the lambs at Passover, they would have the lamb's blood poured into a basin, and the basin would empty into the brook Kidron, which was just to the east. The brook Kidron uh, would be filled with the blood of lambs and sacrificial offerings. The word Kidron means dark or murky. And part of the reason why it would be called dark or murky is it became dark through the blood of the lambs of bulls and goats. And so during Passover, uh, it was recorded 30 years after uh, the events we find here in Matthew, but 30 years later, it was recorded that 256,000 lambs had been slaughtered. So when you consider a quarter million lambs that have been slaughtered and their blood poured into the altar, and the altar, the blood uh, coming, running from the altar into the brook Kidron, that gives you a picture because Jesus is crossing and crossed over the brook Kidron, dark or murky. And as he crossed over, that would still be dark and murky from all the blood of the lambs that had been slaughtered. And then when you consider the fact that the blood of bulls and goats do not take away sin, it gives you a better emphasis or understanding of how precious and valuable the life and the death of Jesus Christ is. In Hebrews 10, 4, it says it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. That's why every year they celebrated Passover. Every year they had offerings and all. There was a reminder yearly for centuries that these, this blood wasn't sufficient. And yet we're told in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, concerning Jesus Christ, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so as Jesus is crossing over the brook Kidron to go into the Garden of Gethsemane, it must have been on his mind that this is about to take place, that he's going to die as the sacrificial lamb. And the Bible tells us he entered the garden. He had commanded his men to watch and to pray, but instead of praying, they had fallen asleep. And Judas had led men to take Jesus. As we were looking at this last time, we, we noticed how Peter had attempted to defend the Lord and attacked a man by the name of Malchus, and how he had, he had struck him in the ear, and a portion of his ear had come off, and Jesus had healed him, and then commanded uh, Peter to put away that sword. And was telling, as we looked last time, he was telling him that the apostles, uh, he doesn't need their help. He has angels at his disposal. I don't need you to protect me. And after all, that's how scripture will be fulfilled. And so we had looked at verse 56, where it concluded by simply saying, all the disciples forsook him and fled. And so that had fulfilled what Jesus had said in verse 31, when he had said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. And so that's what we've been looking at at this point. John tells us in chapter 18, verse 12, the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. And then that's what we're seeing here in verse 57 when it says, those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. So the temple police, the soldiers and others led Jesus away. Matthew does not give us the chronological order of the following events. And John makes it clear that Jesus was first taken to uh, Caiaphas' father-in-law, a man by the name of Annas. In John 18, 13, it says, They led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. And so when you look into John's account, you get more information. If you take notes, you can look at John 18, uh, verses 19 through 24. That speaks concerning Annas' meeting with Jesus. But in a nutshell, he tried to get Jesus to incriminate himself 
was unable to do so, and therefore Jesus is taken, as it says here in verse 57, to Caiaphas. Now, what's taking place here, and we're going to look at this for a moment, in verse 58, Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. He went in and sat with the servants to see the end. And so there he is in the courtyard. He wants to see how things turn out for the Lord. He's motivated by sorrow more than curiosity. And that was commendable compared to the others who were not there. Somebody said Peter rallied from the panic and followed afar off, more courageous than the rest, and yet not courageous enough. And notice how he sat there with the servants to see and to hear, hoping to escape notice. So as this is taking place, verse 59, the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And so they're trying to get people to testify against the Lord Jesus Christ. But their testimony is not in agreement. They actually misquoted Jesus. The, Jesus had said something at the beginning of his ministry that they remembered and they brought up as a charge against him. You see, when you read your Bible, you discover that Jesus cleansed the temple, but he did it on two occasions. He didn't do it at the end of his ministry alone. He actually did it at the beginning of his ministry. And so about three years earlier, Jesus had first cleansed the temple. People had asked him, uh, what gives you the authority to do the things that you're doing and all? And in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, Jesus answered them and said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And so they remembered what he had said in the earlier portion of his ministry, but they misquoted him concerning that. Jesus was not speaking of the temple made with human hands. He was speaking concerning his body, how that he would be crucified, he would die, he'd be buried, but he would be raised the third day. And that's the point that he had been making. So as this is taking place in verse 62, the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. The high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So he says, do you answer nothing? See, Caiaphas is frustrated. The testimonies are inconsistent. It's, it, the, the night is, is drawn closer to the dawn. Uh, people are going to be in the streets soon. He wants to end this trial as quickly as possible. And so he's speaking to him. But notice with me, in verse 63, how it says, Jesus kept silent. And you can almost imagine for a moment how tense that would have been, where this man is speaking to Christ, and Christ is just looking him in the eye, is not saying a word, just looking him in the eye. And as he's looking at him in that way, there has to be something going on in the heart of Caiaphas in that kind of moment there. He's just staring at him, and, and it must have unnerved Caiaphas. In Psalm 38, 12 through 14, it says, those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. And I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. Thus I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth is no response. You see, Jesus is innocent. So to answer false charges is unnecessary. And I've discovered something. You might want to note this as a practical application. Sometimes silence is the best method of dealing with accusations and lies. Sometimes not responding and letting the Lord simply do what the Lord can do is the best thing. And I can tell you that from, from many years of experience. People will believe what they want to believe. But if you get up and you're always defending yourself against things that have been said, people eventually begin to ask questions concerning why you say that. Why do you say that? One of my friends, his name is Bill. Bill listens to me on the radio. He's been my friend since we were in kindergarten together, so it's been over 20 years. And uh, 
And, and we meet, I, I'll be meeting him this upcoming Thursday. I've been mentoring him for a number of years since he got his life right with the Lord. And so he and one of my other friends will come in and I, I spend uh, some time with them and mentor them and answer questions and minister to them. And I've been doing that for a long time now. But <clears throat> when he first started coming uh, and asking his questions, when he first started coming, he, says, he said to me, you know, I listen to you on, on the radio. And I said, you do? And he goes, yeah. I said, that's great. That makes two, you and Marie. But he says, I listen to you on the radio. He says, he says now Bill retired out of the Los Angeles Police Department. He was a training officer. He was a detective. He was undercover. He's got 32 years of police experience. And so he says, you know, as a, a police officer, he says, I can't help but wonder about you. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. He says, the way you've mentioned your wife so many times, are you hiding something? Are you going out on her? You know, and he's playing with me, but sometimes people will, they'll hear you, they'll see something, they'll, they'll wonder about something, and, and they may accuse you of something. And I've discovered over the years, and maybe you can learn this too, that sometimes silence is the best answer, especially when it's a false accusation. Because the more you defend yourself, the more guilty you look. And there are just times when you don't have to say a word. Just leave it in the hands of the Lord. Because the more you say, the more people say, well, there must be something wrong, because look at them defend themselves constantly. Many years ago now, back in 1992, it's been a while, uh, there was somebody sowing seeds of discord who came out of our fellowship and was personally responsible for for hundreds of people leaving our church because he was lying about me and I never stood up and spoke and said anything. I never respond to it, responded to it openly. And I have to tell you that for a long time I had wanted to stand up and I wanted to say what he's saying isn't true. Hundreds of people left. In one summer we saw about 500 people leave because they thought for sure the things that were being said about me were true. And they weren't. They were fabrications. But I never stood up and said anything. And one day I was in a mall, you know, mall purgatory. You guys know what I mean. I was <laughs> getting purged. And I was in a mall in Montclair. And a lady walks up to me and says, Pastor David, I want to apologize. And I had never met her. And I said, OK, about what? She says, so-and-so spoke to me, and I believed what he said, and I left the church, and I just want to apologize for judging you. And I looked at her, and I said, may I ask you a question? And she said, yes. I said, do you honestly believe that I can stand up there and preach the way that I do, when in fact, all of those things that he's saying if those things were true, do you think I could preach the way I do? She said, I didn't really know whether you could or couldn't. I figured, why couldn't you do that? I said, really? She goes, yeah. May I ask you a second question? She said, yes. I said, why did you believe that? What have I done that would make you believe that? I'd like to know. She said, I, I, can't, an I can't answer that other than to say this. She said, I knew him, but I really didn't know you. Isn't that the way it usually is? The first person who comes and says something to us, we believe. But the Proverbs say, until somebody comes and examines. In other words, there's a second side to that. Many people are quick to take the first thing, especially if it looks or sounds believable. There was a while, in, even in this fellowship, again, many years ago, where somebody, and it always comes back to me, said, David Rosales can't possibly love his wife the way that he seems to. You watch, he's going to commit adultery. There were people who were on a David Rosales watch to see whether I would fail in ministry. I am telling you. And you don't have to go up and share all those things. If you knew the amount of things that the average pastor hears about himself every week that are so vile, and it's coming out of the body of Christ. 
is such a vile heart and so many people who want to believe the evil over the good. You would be surprised. And Jesus is there, and Caiaphas is saying, answering, you're answering nothing, but when you're not guilty, you don't have to answer. And Jesus is not answering a thing. So as it continues here, he says in verse 63, the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And so the high priest says, I adjure you by the living God. When he says, I adjure you by the living God, that is the most sacred oath any Jew could make to swear by the name of God. Well, in Jesus' case, any answer is unnecessary because if he answers, that results in what is called self-incrimination. Yet Jesus responds in verse 64, it is as you said. And then he goes on and says, I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. In other words, you can judge me now, Caiaphas, but I will judge you later. And that's the point he's making. Well, when he says that, verse 65, the high priest tore his clothes saying, he's spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, he is deserving of death. And so he tears his clothing. That's a, a sign of mourning, grief, or indignation. He's pretending to be outraged. But in reality, it was his design all along to see Jesus die. When he asked in verse 66, what do you think? They said, he is deserving of death. So they're all on the same page as this is taking place. Verse 67, they spat in his face and beat him. Others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Imagine that. They mocked him, Luke tells us, and they beat him. They blindfolded him. They struck him on the face and asked him, saying, prophesy, who is the one who struck you? Many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. And so this is taking place. He's got a blindfold on, and they're hitting him from different directions with the palms of their hands. And as they're doing that, they mock him and they spit upon him. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, it gives to us a scripture where the Messiah said, I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame. Spitting, spitting on someone's face is the greatest of insults. Somebody said, this face was the face that would break into a smile at the approach of a child. It had been in the habit of beaming graciously upon publicans who became penitents. It was a face that could glow with righteous indignation when the father's house was being desecrated. Above all, it was the face that mirrored the heart of the heavenly father in all his holiness, displeasure with sin, and last but not least, love and tenderness. It was into this face that these men were spitting. It was this face that they slapped. As they're mocking him and treating him in this way, prophesy to us, Christ, who's the one who struck you? Verse 69, Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood, stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out, and he wept 
bitterly. This is the second sermon, different, but gives to us some insight into what's taking place here. He's in a courtyard, the Apostle Peter. He's sitting outside. At that time, the homes were built facing in towards what would be called a common courtyard, which were shared. Annas and Caiaphas shared the same family dwelling. They had separate wings and all. And Jesus is in the courtyard. In John 18, verses 15 and 16, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was known to the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. Mark 14, 54 says, Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And there he sat with the guards, warmed himself at the fire. And so Peter has his first opportunity to deny. And it came through this questioning that's taking place. He's saying no. In verse 72, he's making it very clear. Verse 70, rather. He denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. So he's in his first denial, and I'm going to be developing this with you. I'm going to give you steps to denial in just a moment. But that's the first in verses 69 and 70, it says, A servant girl came to him saying, You were with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it. I don't know him. Now, as I look at this, Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples. When you look at the life of the apostle Peter, and I want to develop this with you just for a moment, uh, he had given up everything. Everything. When Jesus called him, he, he was there uh, with his brother. They were in the boat. He left it all and followed Christ. He gave up everything. And then he began to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he did so for around three years. So Peter had opportunities. I mean, he saw miracles that were performed. He actually was given opportunity to perform them himself. He saw Jesus heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead to life. He saw Jesus when he when he made the water into wine, when he multiplied the fish and the loaves. He saw Jesus do so fantastic things. He walked on water. He saw so much. There were so many life experiences that the apostle Peter had. He would, he would be there with Jesus on camping trips where Jesus and he would have conversations. They would, they would take long walks. Sometimes it would take two, three days of walking. And you know that the master was instructing them along the way. He'd be sharing things that are not even recorded in scripture. And he heard things that nobody else heard. He saw things that aren't even recorded for us to even know about. This is a man who had tremendous experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. He heard the words and he saw the works of Christ. This was somebody who had great relationship with him. He heard him teaching. He lived next to him. He even went so far as to be willing to, to lay his life down. He fought for Jesus Christ, yet only a few hours earlier he had been vowing that he would die for him, and yet now he's denying him. How'd that happen? How'd that happen? You know, there are many Christians who know Scripture. They're experiencing some of the things of the Lord. They even are active in the church. But under pressure, they can fold. We're going to see that in just a moment. You see, in verse 71, there's a second denial. It says in verse 71, when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him, said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus and others. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. So Peter has left the fire that he was there by. He drifts towards Caiaphas' wing of the house. He's trying to avoid being noticed. But somebody is saying, you are also one of them. And so Peter is trying to hide. He doesn't want to completely abandon the Lord, but he's already denied him once, and it's easier to do so the second time. There are sins that we have committed that the first time you ever ever committed that sin, the shame and the sorrow of such a sin might have really, really just torn your soul. You did what you weren't supposed to do. You did it. It was wrong. But did you discover that it's easier to do it the second time than it was the first? The apostle Peter denied the first time. It's going to be a little bit easier to deny him the second time. But this time, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. An oath, he swore before God that he didn't know Jesus. Notice he said, I do not know the man. 
as if Jesus was nothing but a stranger to him. He refused to acknowledge his relationship to the Lord. And then in verse 73, a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them for your speech betrays you. Now that's interesting, your speech betrays you. In John 18, 26 and 27, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. So he was visibly recognizable. But here's something for you. And let me develop this for just a moment. Your speech betrays you. Now, what, wait a minute. What are you talking about? When you look at the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel is a very small nation. How come someone would say your speech betrays you? The answer to that is the apostle Peter had an accent that was different than the southern accent that you had in the city of Jerusalem and surrounding areas. Even in a small area like that, there are dialects. Even in small areas like that, there are accents. I was in, uh, I was in Europe, I forget where. I, I think it may have been Greece, but I'm not sure. And it's many years ago, 1975. And a friend of mine and I were traveling together, and, and we encountered somebody who began to speak to us, and he, he was a, a native of the land that we were in, could have been Greek, and he's speaking to us, and he says, you know, he goes, uh, well, he was speaking English, and I said, you speak a very, very, very proficient English. He said, yeah. He said, I studied for a long time, and all. He says, and I am very interested in language. He says, and I can tell people's languages, he said, and I can tell uh, things about uh, where they're from and all, and he says, and you two have different accents. He said, you must come from different portions of the United States. And we started laughing, and I said, I don't think so. I come from Norwalk, he's from Downey. <laughs> we don't have different accents, to my knowledge. Here's a little trivia for you that you don't care about, but I'm gonna say it anyway. But the fact is, you do have regional accents. Yes, of course you do. You go to Brooklyn, go south, go into certain portions of Texas or going to Louisiana. Try and understand what's being said in Louisiana. <laughs> I was stationed on, uh, in North Carolina for 18 months. And you go into some of the smaller towns and they have some very strong regional accents. Of course, we understand regional accents. Now, Dennis Agajanian, one of our friends who comes in and uh, leads in worship and song, was talking to me not that long ago. And as we were speaking, and I'm real relaxed with him, I've known him for a long time and we we're visiting, Dennis says to me, David, do you know you have an accent? I said, hot dog, are you kidding me? No, I, I go, <laughs> I say, ah, I do, I know that. He says, yeah, you have an accent. And I said, yeah, I know. Um, we all have one form of accent or another. My mom and my dad, their first language was Spanish. My father and mother did not speak Spanish to us unless they were speaking it amongst themselves, hiding things from us. So I learned enough Spanish to know what they were talking about without them knowing it. And I got away with a lot. But my father had an accent of sorts. I'll give you an example. My, my mom told me how my dad, she walked up to my dad and she said, honey, I want a Porsche. So he went out and built her one on the side of the house. <laughs> so my dad, my dad had a little bit of an accent and there were times, there were times that he would say that, you know, going to the front Porsche, you know, that's what he would say. And my mom thought it was very cute and very humorous. But what happened when I grew up, my dad didn't want to speak Spanish to us because he didn't want us to have accents because he had a difficult time when he was a kid. That, that was what his story was to me. Uh, the problem is, is he's the one who spoke English to me. <laughs> so there are words, there are words. If you, if you and I were sitting down and I was real relaxed, you could hear 
that there are words that I use that are very definitely an accented word, and I know it. I just am very controlled when I speak. I'm actually thinking of my words before I speak when I teach. But if you get me around my family, I'm talking to my uncles and aunts and people, my accent begins to come out because that's how I learn to speak English and I'm in a comfortable area where I'm not quite sure how to say things. <laughs> that's just a fact. So when I say that to you, you have accents too. You, we, we all have some, but some regional accents are stronger than others. Now, when you look at the 12 apostles, remember with me that 11 of them were from the north. They were from Galilee. The Galileans had an accent. When you look at the 12, only one of them was from the south. His name was Judas. When you see the name Judas, his name is Judas Iscariot, right? That's what his name is in scripture, Judas Iscariot. Some of you may not know that his name, his last name wasn't Iscariot. When I first got saved, and I'm not being silly, I, when I first got saved, I thought Jesus was his first name and Christ was his last name. I thought Al Capone, the Italian, was a rooster. Because Capone is a rooster. So I said, why would they call this Italian guy a rooster? My mom said, no, his name is Al, A-L, Capone. Oh, see, so, and I don't know why I told you that. I was just thinking of it. <laughs> Because my mind is like that. It just floats. It'll come back. It'll come back. And so Judas Iscariot. You may think Iscariot is his last name. It's not. It's Ishkariot. Ish is Hebrew for man. Kariot is the name of a village. So his name is Judas Ishkariot. Judas, the man from Kariot. Kariot was by Jerusalem. And that's why we know that the 11 were from the north, but one was from the south. Gives you some insight. And so when Jesus is there, and or rather Peter is there, and he's denying, someone says, your, your speech betrays you. Your speech betrays you. It's like Rawl telling me he's from Germany. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's one of my dearest friends. Some people get insulted if I say it. But let me tell you something. He and I were together in India years ago, Raul, Raul Reese and I. We traveled to India, did ministry for two weeks together. He was speaking to an Indian fella, a man from India, Indian fella. And the Indian man says to him, you have an accent. And Raul goes, well, my last name is Reese. And he goes, and what kind of name is that? He said, that's a German name. The man says, well, you have an accent again. And Raul turns to me and said, see, he knows I'm German. I said, yes, yes, indeed, you sound just like Arnold. <laughs> but anyway, we have accents, I'll get back to it. And so what's going on here is he is being identified physically. They recognize him. I saw you. I know who you are. You're the one who, who, um, who hit Malchus in, in John 18, 26. Again, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, didn't I see you in the olive grove? So as an eyewitness, no, I saw you and you have an accent. Well, when this takes place, verses 74 and 75, he began to curse and swear saying, I do not know the man immediately a rooster crowed. Curse and swear. When I first got saved, I thought, well, he was a, he was a, a sailor. He was a fisherman. He must have been cussing. No, he's not a profane prophet. When it says that he cursed and swear, what this, what this literally is speaking of is he began calling down the death penalty upon himself. He was saying, may God kill me and send me to hell if I am lying. That's what he was saying. He wasn't cussing. He was calling curses upon himself. May I go to hell for this? And that's what he's doing. That's how serious he is. Well, immediately, verse 74, a rooster crowed. Now, something else happens, and I want to develop this with you, and this is the heart of what I wanted to share with you today. 
As a rooster crows, something else happens. In Luke 22, 61 and 62, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Somehow, the apostle Peter and Jesus, somehow their eyes locked. And when he looks at him, and I want to develop this with you, steps to backsliding, steps to denial. Peter is in that progressively emotional momentum, denied, denied, finally, may God send me to hell, that emotion where, his, where he finally just, it all spills out. And when he cries that out and he says, I do not know the man, you have to have it in your mind's eye for a moment. When he says that, the rooster crows and he looks and there's Jesus looking at him eye to eye. What would that do? What? What would that do to you? He didn't even have a moment to prepare for that, that experience. Not even a moment to prepare, just a shock of it. I, when our church was young many years ago now, maybe two years, three years old, I got a phone call. There was a man in our fellowship, his name was George. George had recently, actually he had driven by my home and saw me standing in the front yard and he stopped. And he walked up to me, George, and he was older than me, I was in my early 30s at the time. And he walks up to me as I was standing in the front yard, he says, Pastor David. I said, hi, George, how are you? He said, I just wanted to stop and say hello for a moment. I saw you standing here, just wanted to say hi. I said, well, it's nice, nice to see you. And he goes, you know, and I'll never forget this. He says, you know how much you love Pastor Chuck? I said, yeah. He said, let me tell you something. I love you the way you loved him, love him. And I looked at him and I thought, well, that's kind of you to say that, but you can't imagine how much I love my pastor. But that's nice. And one of those moments, like, thank you. But that, this man was older than me. He was a number of years older than me. And he said, I want you to know I love you like that. George is dear to me. I get a phone call. George is in the hospital. Can you see him? And he was in West Covina. And I said, I'll find a moment. Yes, I'll go and see him. And so I call my wife and I say, honey, I'm going to go see George. He's in the hospital. You want to go with me? So she did. Marie and I get in our car. We drive to the hospital. And as I enter in, I ask where he is, what floor he's on. They tell me a particular floor. We climb in an elevator and we go up two, three flights and all. And the door opens. And when the door opens to the elevator, it's a dark area. It's all dark. And I, Marie and I are standing there. And, and as we, we stepped out of the elevator, it's, it's all, there's no light in the place. And, and a doctor comes around a corner and acts startled. And he, oh, what are you doing here? And I look at him and I say, my name's David Rosales. I'm a, I'm a pastor. One of the members of my church, George, has been um, brought into the hospital and I came to see him. And he says, the doctor, I'll never forget this, says to me, you haven't heard? And I said, heard what? George just died. When he said George just died, the sound of the word died hadn't faded in there. When his wife, George's wife, came around the corner, the word died and the wife, you don't have a second to prepare for that. You don't have a second. It will always be in my heart. I will always remember that. How do you respond? I didn't even have a moment. 
Have you been there? Some of you have. Some of you have. I know you have. That's a shared moment many of us go through. You don't have a second to prepare sometimes. It, life just seems to happen suddenly. And then you wake up and you say to yourself, come to yourself and you say, how'd this happen? The apostle Peter was so caught up with the, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. And then he sees Jesus. Can you imagine? How did the Lord look at him? What do you think Jesus did? Do you think Jesus looked at him and said, pig, denier, I told you so. He didn't do any of that. You know what will break a person quickly is compassion, love, love. Love will very often break a person. See, if, you, if somebody speaks to you across words, says something to you, I knew you would, then you just get all proud and you just start fighting for your rights. But what happens when somebody doesn't do that to you? What happens when someone looks at you with a compassion and a love and even a disappointment? It breaks you. The apostle Peter had been warned. Jesus said, Satan has desired to obtain you and to sift you even as wheat is sifted. But I've prayed for you. And when you're converted, you strengthen your brethren. How did this happen? You see, he realizes his sin. He begins to weep. Notice verse 75, he went out and he wept bitterly. I wonder if you've been there. Have you ever been broken so deeply that you have to find a hole to climb in and just cry your eye out to the Lord? God, forgive me, a sinner. God, forgive me. I never thought I could get there. How did I end up here? How? I knew better. I was raised better. I, how? Steps to denial. One, Peter estimated his, overestimated his own strength, and he placed confidence in his flesh. Peter had a higher regard for his own loyalty to Jesus than he had for Jesus' warnings. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit will gain honor. In Romans 7, 18, Paul said, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. One he overestimated his own strength and underestimated his carnality. Be careful. You're not as strong as you think you are. You just aren't. If any man think he stand, let him take heed, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, lest he fall. Keep that in mind. It's a very good thing to remember where you came from. It's a good thing not to want to go back to it, but to remember. It's a good thing. I know what I was washed from. And I don't want to go back. And I need Christ every day. Second, Peter followed at a distance. He was afraid of being identified with the Lord. He didn't walk close by him. He followed at a distance, the scripture tells us. You get saved and the first thing you do as a brand new believer, perhaps if you're anything like me, is you go to Bible studies. You get involved. You're told when you got saved, the, the follow-up counselor may have said to you, read the word. He may have said to you, or she may have said to you, pray. Have fellowship with other Christians and, and go tell somebody what Jesus did in your life. Those are the four basic things every new believer hears when, when you're followed up. You know, get in the word of God. And so what do you do? You start going to Bible studies. You, you get involved. When I was 20 years old, I went to Bible studies as fervently as I used to go to parties. 
I want to know Jesus Christ. I want to know what he's done in my life. I want to be equipped for works of service. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. My life is completely changed. I'm going to follow him with everything within me. And that's how it was in my early days. And it's pretty much remained that way to this point now. But for some, they start following Jesus at a distance. Where they used to go to Bible study. Oh, they did until they got a boyfriend. When they got a boyfriend or a girlfriend at that point, well, there are other things to do. They did until they got married. After they got married, there are things we have to do on Sunday. After all, we work on Saturday and Sunday. Well, you know, sometimes we just need to get away. And then they did until they had their kids. They used to go to Wednesday nights. They used to go to Sunday nights. They go, they went all the time. That's what they did. They served together, but now we have kids. We can't do that. And then the kids grow up. Oh no, we really can't be that involved because they're in soccer, they're in in, in, in softball, they're in and you name the sport that takes them away on a Sunday and that's what they do. And then when the kid's 18 and doesn't want to follow the Lord, then the parents come crying and saying, I don't know what happened. We took him to church. We went at least once every three months. I am telling you, common story, common story. Following at a distance. Following at a distance. Identifying, but not identifying. The third thing, he tried to blend in with the world. He actually was standing near the fire when he was first identified. He tried to blend in. But trying to blend in put himself in a position of compromise. Listen, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And our lives are intended by God to be a stark contrast to those who don't know Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4, we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. You're not running with them anymore. You're not doing the things that they did anymore. And the people think you're weird for that. So what happens? Well, the church has such a love affair with the world that we don't really have a distinguishing characteristic anymore. When you encounter Christians who are living with their boyfriends or their girlfriends, just the way that the world does, when you, when you encounter married couples who are, got married in church because they profess a love for Christ and they're divorced now or going out on one another, and all, what's the difference between them and the world? There's nothing any different. When you have Christians who divorce at a greater rate than atheists do, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. When you have to give seminars to teach men and women to dress modestly, there's something wrong. There is something wrong. That you actually have to have people and say, listen, you can't do that. Years ago, years ago, we had a young woman who was serving in our tape ministry. It was a warm summer day like it is today. And I happened to walk in to the tape dispensing area it's when we were at Ontario Christian Elementary School, and I walked in to where we used to have a sliding door where we could sell the tapes after the service. And when I walked in, I, I had to, like, oh, my. She was wearing a crop. I, they used to call it a crop top. I don't know what they call it now. It's one of these things here. And Daisy Dukes. Now, I know what Daisy Dukes are because <laughs> I saw it with my eyes. And I walked in and I go, oh man, oh no. We sold more tapes than when he ever did before. All these men, they're coming back. I need another one for my brother. <laughs> Embarrassing. I had to walk up to one of the ladies in our church and I said, would you do me a favor? Would you please tell her that that isn't appropriate? You don't dress like that. One, in public, but two... You're in church. Do you know that was over 30 years ago? And it hasn't gotten better in our society. It's gotten worse. And the funny thing about it is you got men who are dressing weird too now. <laughs> it's true. I had guys wearing those bicycle shorts. You know the little bicycle shorts? They're in the front row. I say, man. Why don't you ride your bike home? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> I 
I don't get it. So we're living in a time when we have blended in so much to the world. We act like them, we think like them. Well, you've got to watch out for that. We are in the world, but we're not to be of the world. We need to be aware of the days that we live in. And so be careful. Don't blend in with the world. I'm not saying dress all weird and this and that. I'm not saying that women shouldn't wear makeup and men should wear suits. I'm not saying that. I'm saying be aware. Just be aware. Don't blend in with the world. A fourth thing, he was not prepared for a subtle challenge. You see, the first questions were posed in a way that made it easy for him to say no. He was actually given an easy route to denial, but the last question was like a trap. John 18, 26, did I not see you in the garden with him? So when a direct challenge occurred, he completely forgot the Lord. That's why verse 74 says he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. When this takes place, he went out and he wept bitterly. He failed. His heart was broken. He cried. He was broken. He forgot that he had been warned. Here's something to remember. Sin results in devastation, ruin, pain, and sorrow. It can never produce what it promises to produce on a permanent basis. There is enjoying sin for a season. There is an enjoyment to it. If you didn't like it, you wouldn't do it. But the repercussions that come later are not worth the thrill that you have at that moment. Keep that in mind. Because what you want right now and you want to have right now, it, it promises you, it promises you, that sin promises you that if you do this, you will be happy forever. That's a lie. That's a lie. Listen, I, I've been around for a while. I've ministered for a long time now. And I've seen a lot of broken hearts. I've ministered to a lot of broken people. Can't imagine how many over the years, how many broken hearts I've tried to help patch, how many broken marriages, how many broken children, how many broken women, how many broken families and friendships, how many losses. I've, I've conducted funerals for, for, for men who died of AIDS. I, I've tried to minister to people whose, whose lives went in the wrong direction. And I'm telling you, sin seems to be something you want. And it promises you that it can make you happy. It does. But the end is destruction. It always is. It always is. I remember a guy who came to my office. He had actually called the church and said, I need to see the pastor immediately. I have an emergency. I need to see him. I was preparing an evening service, and I, 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 I can't meet with It's an emergency. I need to see him now. This is, again, in the early days of our church. And my secretary says he's insisting. He says he only needs a few minutes of your time. It's an emergency. I said, listen, I don't take lunch. Have him come at lunch, and I'll talk to him. So he came. I'll never forget the conversation. He came to my office. He entered in. Thank you, Pastor, for seeing me. I said, of course. How can I help you? It's just I have a question I need an answer for, and I need it today. And I said, how can I help you? I want to ask if God is a forgiving God. And I said, of course he is. Of course he is. Does God forgive every sin, Pastor? I said, God forgives every sin. He said, God is compassionate, long-suffering. If you confess your sin, he washes it away. Every sin. Every sin. Why? Even the sin of adultery. I said, the sin of adultery is the sin that God can wash and cleanse you from, of course. I'll never forget the conversation. Because, he said, that's all I needed to know. Because he had an affair going with a woman at work. He left his wife, 
ran off with this woman and did so thinking he had permission because God forgives every sin. You can't do that to God. You can't plan your sin out and then say, well, he's gracious, but that's in the church today. There's a mentality like that today. If God is truly gracious, why wouldn't he forgive me? Because you have planned out sin with no concern whatsoever for the repercussions. Sin will take you down. It'll tear your life up. It destroys your family. It destroys you. It's destructive. And you see me so many times when I come up and I tear up. You don't know why I do. Let me tell you why I do. Can you imagine the amount of pain I have heard since 1973? How many tears I have cried with people. People say, where's your joy? I have joy in the Lord, but my heart breaks for sin. Because when I see children, I'll never forget the little boy who is six years old standing with his little slumped shoulders while mama is holding, holding her, her little boy. And she says to me, Pastor, can you please pray for my son? I said, of course. She said, his father told him yesterday he doesn't love him. And I'm looking at this little boy. And he took him in my arms and I held him. Sin destroys, guys. It destroys. It destroys. And you do not sin just, oh, you take steps towards it. You, over, you overthink your strength. You walk at a distance. You aren't prepared for the subtle things that can happen. They'll step you right to the path and then bang, and you wake up and you weep. Bitterly. And that's what he did, because after he failed, Jesus looks at him. He looks back at Jesus. The rooster is crowing, and it hits him. I did exactly what I said I'd never do. I said I would die for him, and I just denied him, even as he said I would. And he went out, and he wept bitterly. He failed. But I'm not going to... I'm not going to close with the Apostle Peter remaining in sin because one of the most beautiful things we know about our God is he is rich in mercy and he is forgiving. He is. Micah 7, 18, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He went out and wept bitterly that the Lord Jesus Christ had plans for this man and he restores him and he uses him to expand the kingdom. kingdom. And, and later Peter writes and says in 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. Grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Hold fast. Don't let go. Follow Jesus as much as you have within you every day. Be aware that the enemy wants to take you down. Hold fast. And when you fail, which we all do, remember that God is merciful and he forgives us our sin. He cleanses us and delivers us and he can use us for his glory. Don't plan on sinning, but thank God that God can even use the worst things that we've ever done, turn it around and make our life a testimony of his grace. Amen.